สวัสดีครับ Hello and welcome to Daily Wisdom, Walking the Path with the Buddha. Today's our day to do loving kindness meditation together. Two weeks ago, I refreshed everyone's memory on what loving kindness meditation is and why we do it and actually how to do it. So today, we're just going to go right into loving kindness meditation as a guided practice to help you cultivate loving kindness in the mind and move out this anger, hatred, ill will. This will help you to be more loving and kind and have a genuine interest in seeing others be well in your daily life through your practice. But we need to cultivate this in the mind to transform any anger, hatred, ill will, any resentment that the mind is holding on to, the aversion where the mind wants to push away people in our life. By practicing loving kindness meditation, you'll be able to then practice in daily life. Being loving and kind to all people around you, and one of the ways that you can do that is being polite, kind, friendly, and respectful to everyone without judgment. So, as we do loving kindness meditation today, just a short little reminder that the way we do this is we do breathing mindfulness meditation first in order to clear out the mind, focus on the breath. Really start to ease into meditation. Then we're going to do those affirmations where we're repeating in the mind quietly affirmations of these rings: "May I be peaceful. May I be safe. May I be well. May I be free of all discontentedness in the suffering it causes." Then we're going to move to successive rings, eventually getting to all beings. And in your meditation, when you're doing this privately. You should construct these rings based on the relationships that you have, and the places, and the people, the situations where you're having anger, hatred, ill will. You would like to include those people and those groups of people into your meditation, so it's customized for you, and you're transforming your mind. This meditation, when you're doing affirmations, it's not to send people loving kindness. It's not a prayer. It's not trying to change other people and wishing that they will be more loving and kind to you. Instead, it's actually you transforming your mind with those people in mind, so that then, when you're around those people or those groups of people, that you can conduct yourself with bodily, verbal, and mental conduct. That is more loving and more kind, and this will help you to generate wholesome decisions where you'll experience wholesome results. Whereas if you went into situations with anger, hatred, and ill will, and even even a slight annoyance, you would end up treating those people rough or harsh or aggressive, and all that's going to end up coming back to you. Additionally, this meditation can be used for people or relationships or groups of people that. You feel have harmed you in the past, or that you have harmed. This way, the mind doesn't hold on to any resentment, and because that resentment is only harming your own mind and your own ability to get to enlightenment. As long as the mind is harboring any kind of anger, hatred, or ill will, it's going to be inhibited from attaining enlightenment. So, this meditation is to transform your mind so you can let go of those things from the past and anybody in your current. Life in the present moment, you'll be able to practice in a way that has a genuine interest in seeing all beings be well, and you're not interested in causing harm to others, but instead practice loving kindness through your intentions, your speech, and your actions. Then we'll finish up the meditation with a little bit more breathing mindfulness meditation to kind of ease us out, because sometimes as you're meditating, it will kind of bring to the surface. A bit of frustration or irritation or hatred, because that's what you're meditating about: is to cultivate this loving kindness and focus on beings that maybe you do have anger, hatred, or will for. So that can kind of surface in the mind. So this breathing mindfulness meditation we do on the backside is to kind of settle all that stuff and clear it out of the mind. And then, as we always do, I'll open things up to any questions you guys have for anything that you've been studying in this program, or anything that you're studying in the book series, anything that's going on in your meditation practice, any life situations that you have going on, and you're interested in getting help on how to apply the Buddhist teachings. That would be an ideal time to ask those questions and get help with the teachings from the Buddha. So, if you'd like to go ahead and pull up a cushion or a chair to get Your lower body in position for meditation. The lower body should be comfortable. 
but not luxurious and not painful. So if you're on the floor, you might lightly cross your legs, put a cushion under your rear to lessen the angle at your hip, your knees and your ankles. Your hands and arms, those should just be resting comfortably in your lap. The Buddha put his right hand over his left with his thumbs together and then just put that in the lap. That makes it so that your arms and your hands are not engaged in any way. They should just be relaxed, just like your lower body, nice and comfortable, not luxurious, but not painful. The upper body should be erect. By keeping the muscles in the upper body erect, not slouched and not real rigid, by keeping them erect, it ensures that the mind stays attentive and alert during the meditation because your meditation should be active. There should be an active, purposeful, dedicated training session where you're actively training the mind. And here with loving kindness meditation, we're doing two different types of meditation. So the mind needs to be active and attentive and alert in order to do the work that you're doing in meditation. It's not a time to just zone out and just kind of, you know, be in kind of uh, slumber land. It's time to really do work in meditation because then daily life is a lot easier when you do this work in your training. It's just like a, a, a all-star athlete would do lots of training so that when it's time for the competition, it goes really smoothly and really easy for them. Your meditation is the same way. You're training and doing lots of work here so that then daily life can be really smooth and really easy for you. So keep that upper body erect so that the mind can stay attentive, alert, and be able to do the work that it needs to do during the meditation. Next, just close the eyes and start breathing in through the nose and out through the nose, taking some nice deep breaths, breathing in through the nose, experiencing the full breath and out through the nose. Your breaths may be different than the guidance that I'm providing. This is just a reminder for you. This is your practice. You're doing the work. So just as a reminder, breathe in through the nose and out through the nose. You should start establishing the breath where it's nice and steady a natural breath where you can experience the full inhale and the exhale. Not trying to control the breath or force the breath, but just experiencing a nice gradual inhale through the nose. And a nice gradual exhale through the nose. You can start fixating the mind on the breath. That's the sound of the breath or sensation of air moving into the nose. The breath is the present moment. So by fixating the mind there, you're training the mind to be in the present moment. Breathing in and out. Breathing in and out. I'm going to do some chanting to ease us into meditation and then come back with a bit more guidance. If you know these chants, you're welcome to chant along. Arahang Samma Samhoto Mahakawa Potang Mahakawanang Apiwate Ami Savakato Mahakavata Tammo 
दामं नमसामी सुपाठे पानो महाकवतो सावकसंहो संघं नमामि नपमोरसाभाकवतो हरहतो समसंपुतसं नपमोरसाभाकवतो हरहतो समसंपुतसं नपमोरसाभाकवतो हरहतो समसंपुतसं इति पिसो महकवां आरहं समसं होतो विचारणं समोनो सखातो रोकावितो हनु तेरो पुरीसा दामासाति सातावा मानुसनं होतो भागवाते Okay, you should be breathing in through the nose and out through the nose. The breath is the anchor in your breathing mindfulness meditation. This is the present moment. When the body breathes in and breathes out, that's the present moment. Fixate the mind on the breath, the present moment. Breathing in and out. This meditation, we're developing awareness of mind or mindfulness. Wherever you're aware that the mind is not on the breath, it's in the past or the future. There's thoughts, ideas, perceptions. Cut those off. Let them go. Bring the mind back to the breath, the present moment. Breathing in and out. Breathing in and out. The mind wandering off the breath, not wanting to be in the present moment, not peaceful to reside in the present moment. This is craving. The mind is longing for the past. It's yearning for the future. It wants to have all these thoughts, ideas, perceptions. Cutting that off and letting it go is to eliminate craving, desire, attachment. Training the mind to not do that. Bringing it back to the breath. Breathing in. and out. Breathing in and 
and out. So that's the work you're doing here, observing the mind, developing mindfulness or awareness of mind. When it's not on the breath, it's having craving, desire, attachment. You're cutting that off, letting it go, coming back to the breath. I'm going to let you do this work to focus the mind on the breath. Breathing in. In, out.
Continue, <clears throat> continuing to breathe in through the nose and out through the nose. Continuing to focus the mind on the breath. On the out breath, wherever you get to that, repeat this affirmation in the mind. May I be peaceful. Be safe. May I be well. May I be free of all discontentedness and the suffering it causes. May we be peaceful. May we be safe. May we be well. May we be free of all discontentedness and the suffering it causes. May all those who are friendly towards me be peaceful. May they be safe. May they be well.
may they be free of all discontentedness and the suffering it causes. May all those who are neutral towards me be peaceful. May they be safe. May they be well. May they be free of all discontentedness in the suffering it causes. May all those who are hateful towards me be peaceful. May they be safe. May they be well. May they be free of all discontentedness and the suffering it causes. May all beings be peaceful. May they be safe.
May they be well. May they be free of all discontentedness and the suffering it causes. Continue focusing on the breath, the present moment, cutting off any thoughts, ideas, or perceptions when the mind's not on the present moment, the breath. Breathing in. And out.
We can start to open up for any questions you guys have, but as we do, let me just share a little something with you guys. It's wonderful that you guys are meditating like this here in the group, and I have a feeling you're probably meditating on your own as well, because in order to experience the results on this path, each practitioner has to do the work. By us individually doing the work, we're improving the condition of our mind. And as you heard me share at the beginning, this meditation of loving kindness is helping us to have loving kindness, this genuine interest in seeing all beings be well for other people. So even when we say things in the affirmation like, may all those who treat me uh, hatefully be peaceful, right? So we're not asking them to be peaceful. We're not trying to do anything to improve them through our meditation because that's impossible that's not the truth that can't happen what we're doing is we're training our mind that when somebody is hateful to us that we can then think in our mind may they be peaceful may they be safe may they be well may they be free of all discontentedness and the suffering that it causes because obviously if someone's being hateful to you their they have discontentedness their mind is unenlightened they have pollution of the mind there's craving anger and ignorance there and for us we're interested in practicing nothing but loving kindness with all beings even when they're hateful to us so it's really easy to have loving kindness for someone who's friendly to us or who's neutral with us but it's in those situations where someone's being hateful to you that you need to be able to cut off any kind of thoughts that might arise where you're interested in being hateful back. One of the Buddha's famous discourses, he talks about this monks, if they were kind of captured by somebody and they had a two-person saw sawing you in pieces, limb by limb by limb. The Buddha said, if hate arises in your mind in that situation, 
you wouldn't be practicing his teachings. That even in that situation, if you're being sawed limb by limb by limb, have this loving kindness for them, realizing that they don't understand what they're doing. They're craving anger and ignorance, their hatefulness. They don't understand what they're doing necessarily. And that in that moment, if you're practicing loving kindness, then you are practicing his teachings. So if you're being sawed apart limb by limb, you're probably going to die. And you don't want to have hatefulness running through the mind at that time. You're only interested in having this genuine interest for all beings to be well. So in any situation, whether people are friendly, neutral, or hateful towards you, just always be thinking, may they be peaceful, may they be safe, may they be well, may they be free of all discontentedness and the suffering it causes. And in that situation, if your intentions, speech, and actions are purified with loving kindness, then you're practicing the path to enlightenment. And in the meantime, you might feel some anger and frustration or hatefulness arising in certain situations. And that's where you cut it off and you let it go. That's where we're doing in breathing mindfulness meditation is training the mind to cut off those unwholesome thoughts and let them go. In meditation, we're training the mind to cut off and let go of all thoughts and bring the mind back to the breath. But in daily life, we're, tr we're going to only be cutting off and letting go of any unwholesome thoughts in daily life. But in meditation, when you're doing the training, you're cutting off all thoughts. But in meditation, you're not going to be able to eliminate all thoughts. That's not the goal of breathing mindfulness meditation. The goal is to become aware that the mind is off the breath, off the present moment, sooner and sooner and sooner. That's one goal, is to build this awareness of mind and become aware of the mind being off the breath. The other goal is to get it make it easier and easier for you to cut off and let go of thoughts when they arise because they're going to arise in meditation. Even if there's no thoughts in the mind at all and you're thinking, wow, the mind is so peaceful. There's no thoughts. Well, that's a thought, right? So you're never going to eliminate thoughts in meditation or in daily life either. But what you're doing is you're quieting the mind. You're stilling the mind. You're bringing the mind to singular focus and practicing right concentration by focusing on the breath in the present moment. So wherever you see the mind is not on the breath, cut it off, let it go, bring the mind back, but know that that's going to happen. Even when the mind's enlightened, you're still going to have an occasional thought, but there's going to be these longer and longer gaps between them, and it's going to be so easy to let go of those thoughts and bring the mind back. So that's what you do in daily life. When you feel that hatred, that anger, that ill will arising, you're then able to easily cut it off, let it go, and practice loving kindness with this person so that you're not producing any unwholesome gamma or any unwholesome decisions which would cause unwholesome results or unwholesome gamma. And that's how you clean up your practice. So now, if, or even before you were on the path, if when somebody was hateful to you, you were hateful back, that's going to keep producing unwholesome results for you. But what you're doing is you're transforming the mind that even when someone's hateful to you, any kind of hateful thoughts that might arise, you can cut that off and let it go easier and easier. Eventually, those hateful thoughts won't arise at all because you'll cut it back to the stump and they won't actually arise. What you would like to arise in that situation where you're being faced with anger, hatred, and ill will is you would like to eliminate this craving, desire, attachment, this anger, this hatred, this ill will. You would like to take right effort and cut that off and let it go and then arise this loving kindness. It doesn't mean you have to be uh, utterly smoozing this person. It could mean that you just ignore them. It could mean that you say nothing. It could mean that you walk away. Uh, that is at least eliminating the contact. And therefore, if you eliminate the contact, then you're not going to produce any unwholesome results. Because if there's no contact, you can't produce unwholesome gamma. It's gamma in the decision. I'm sorry, it's contact in our decisions that are going to create the unwholesome gamma. So in some situations, 
you might just choose to walk away or ignore this hate that's coming towards you. And that could be a practice of loving kindness. And in your mind, rather than hating that person back, just think, may they be well, may they be peaceful, may they be free of discontentedness. And this is how you transform the mind and it becomes easier and easier in each situation that you're in. So doing the work in meditation is training the mind to do that in a somewhat of a sterile environment. And then when you go out in the world, that's where you've got to practice it and get easier and easier at being able to practice in the heat of the moment when you're being faced with friendliness, when you're being faced with neutrality, when you're being faced with hateful uh, speech or actions. And keep in mind that even when someone's being friendly to you, if the mind's craving that, desiring that, you might feel these pleasant feelings spring up in the mind, this happiness, this excitement, this elation. You would like to cut that off too. Because if you allow that to happen when people are friendly, then when people are hateful, you're going to feel the painful feelings of anger, sadness, frustration. So if someone's friendly to you, great, they're friendly. Just maintain the mind in the middle. If they're hateful to you, okay, that's fine. Just maintain the mind in the middle. Allow the mind to come to the middle and permanently reside there. And then by you training in meditation to find that middle and know where that is, then it becomes easier in daily life. So let's see what questions you guys have about anything on this path, including your meditation practice. The way that you can ask questions is you can put those into Facebook, YouTube, or Zoom in the comment section. Our moderators, Bossom and James, will see that and be able to get your question asked during the class. If you're in Zoom, you can electronically raise your hand, ask any questions or follow up questions directly. So let's see if there's any questions you guys have today to get help. So do, when we do experience hatred from others, we're really just experiencing a reflection of their own discontent mind rather than anything toward us, which is how people tend to take that, would you say? Yes. If you understand that there's no self here, there's no me, there's no I, the universal truth of non-self has been understood reflect it on and you're practicing to let that go that self-image and that self-identity when someone's yelling at you there is no you here they're just um, discontent for some reason and they're expressing their anger in the mind and they're venting it towards you but if you turn that around and be hateful back it's just like a ping pong ball going back and forth on the table so if they hit the ping pong ball to you you just say, hmm, that's nice. You put the ping pong ball down. They hit another ping pong ball. Okay, that's nice. And you just keep stacking them up. Or eventually you walk away from the ping pong table and you're like, I'm not playing ping pong anymore. Right? So that's the way you extinguish this. And if this person is a type of person that you're able to, you might choose to distance yourself from that person, spending less and less time with them, and ultimately choosing to no longer associate with them. In some situations, that's easier than others. Sometimes, depending on the relationship, that's not so easy to do. But um, that is a way to extinguish that unwholesome karma is one, you can just keep not responding back. And hopefully that person will, over time, see the error of their ways and improve their conduct or the second option is you can just choose to move away from that person and distance yourself those would be the two ways to extinguish this yes it seems very helpful for us in cultivating compassion to see what we may consider our enemies or people who are expressing hatred toward us as simply unwell essentially yeah, and even in the situation where someone else is being hateful or vindictive or resentful or jealous, even though you know those qualities of mind are coming from them and that's their own intention, speech, and actions, or that's their own body, verbal, or mental conduct, even though that's them, a wise practitioner would investigate their own practice and see what is it, if anything, that I am doing that might be arising that in their mind. So even though we know it's their conduct, 
we have to look at our own intention, speech, and actions and see is there anything there that I've done or have been doing that has made this arise. So that would be a wise and prudent thing to do. And then as you do that more and more and you start shedding away your lack of practice and you're practicing right intention to perfection and you've purified that really well and you're practicing right speech, those five factors of well-spoken speech, and you've purified your speech really well. You're practicing right action, and you've purified that really well, practicing that right livelihood and so forth. Then what right view, part of what right view is about is accepting responsibility for all the decisions you're making in life. You know, the right view is the Four Noble Truths, but if you look at the Four Noble Truths, essentially what the Buddha is doing is showing you how you're causing your own discontentedness. And a wise practitioner would then look internally whenever someone else is discontent, knowing that they're causing their own discontentedness. But at the same time, how's my speech? Did I practice with all five factors? Yeah, I did. Okay, how's my actions? Did I cause any harm on my bodily actions? And if you look through your intention, speech, and actions, and you're not seeing anything, then you know this is purely something on their side. And if you're not sure, that's where you can reach out to your teacher. and You can say, hello, teacher, I had this situation. This happened, this happened, this happened. Here's how I responded. This is what I did. Is there anything that you're seeing that I could have done to improve? Because as you shed away more and more of these unwholesome aspects of the mind, you'll get to a point where people will still be hateful or vindictive towards you because perhaps things in the past that happened months or years ago. And you might be in situations where 80% of the problem is them and 20% is you. But if you don't focus on their 80% because you can't change that person, you can't affect change. All you can do is improve your own practice. So focusing on your 20%, that's where the real gains are, the real progress is. And then as you whittle this away more and more, it might be their 95% of the problem and your 5%, but focus on your 5% because that's where the real growth is. And you might even get to a point where they're 99% and it's only 1% you. Well, focus on your 1% because that's where you're gonna make progress because now you won't be doing those same other relationships and new re choose to keep being the way that they are in, that's their choice. You can't take care of that 1%. Because if I do that, then I'm, then I'm fulfilling my job, my responsibility, and applying right effort here in order to eliminate the unwholesome qualities and arise the wholesome qualities. If this person gets help, great, I'm all for that. But if they don't get help, then okay, at least I'm doing what I need to do to improve my practice, my, my mind, and my life. That's where your real bang for the buck is, so to speak. It also seems like an important reminder that even if we have wholesome intent, we can still unintentionally cause harm. So it's always important to look at ourselves and to not have that ego to think that we're above causing harm just because we don't intend to, I suppose. Yeah, that's another part of this. When you're doing the inner reflection and looking inward and seeing if you're practicing each step of the Eightfold Path, what you'd like to do is also see if these things are in sync because sometimes your intentions can be really pure, so pure, but your speech and your actions aren't in sync with that. And when it comes out, again, if that person's angry and hateful, they're causing it themselves, but your speech is creating the conditions in which it allows their mind to then get angry. So an enlightened being is able to uh, practice the Eightfold Path to Perfection where they are ensuring that all these steps on the Eightfold Path are purified so that then they're not creating any conditions which would cause this person to uh, have craving anger or ig ignorance arise. And if you're able to practice that way, then you'll find that your relationships become very peaceful and very calm and very still because you know how to make wise decisions in all your relationships. And this is one of the reasons why you end up getting rid of some fear because some people have fear to make new friends 
because they're afraid this person is going to be hateful or they have distrust for this person because other friends did something bad to them and they're holding on to those bad experiences. So when you start purifying and you get more and more purified in the whole Eightfold Path, you can have relationships with anybody because nobody can hurt you because your mind is fully protected. That's why the Buddha talks about going to the Buddha, his teachings in the community for refuge. This refuge that he's talking about is the mind is protected from anything external, that nothing can cause harm to the mind because the more you learn and you practice these teachings and you train, the mind's protected from any kind of harm. And you can gradually see this happening as the mind becomes unshakable and very stable. We spoke about imagery on Sunday, and I was wondering, as we meditate, we may have an inclination to take these symbols that remind us of the teachings and perhaps put them around our meditation space and maybe have a sense of sacredness or even holiness about where we're meditating. I was wondering if you could discuss any positive and also perhaps counterproductive elements of doing that. Yeah, I think that symbols and imagery can, artwork, you know, statues, they can be a great reminder for us in our practice uh, to practice, especially if you already know the teachings and then you associate those teachings to the imagery. So when you see the imagery, you know, boom, it clicks in your mind right away. So whether it's in your space where you meditate or in your kitchen or in your car or whatever, these can be great little reminders for you. But also, you know, in terms of your meditation space, I also suggest after you've been meditating for a while and you start feeling some stability is to start moving your meditation location around so that it introduces some impermanence to your meditation practice. And this will help create some more stability in the mind. So if you're always meditating with the exact same cushion, the exact same location, all these kind of things, change locations, even within the same house, just move to a different room or even go outside in your yard or on the deck or in the back. Doing that occasionally will introduce some impermanence into the mind and the mind can start getting comfortable with this because the mind's gonna wanna hold on even to your location of meditating. So while you may decide to put and sprinkle these imageries around you know, your kitchen, your meditation space, your car, different things, these can be great little reminders for you but you also aren't interested in allowing them to become attachments where the mind is holding on to them because we know they're not permanent. If you put one of these images on your refrigerator, at some point it's gonna get ripped, it's gonna get torn, it's gonna fall down, you're gonna lose it, something's gonna happen. So if the mind is holding on to it so tightly, then it can experience discontentedness when these things happen. So one of the things that I suggest that you guys do is whenever you're involved in something, just always know right from the get-go, it's impermanent. So like when you buy a brand new pair of shoes or you're considering buying a brand new pair of shoes, even on the way to the store, just know like, okay, these shoes are just serving a purpose. They're going to protect the feet. They're impermanent. Yeah, it's a new style. I would like to get them, but it's not what's going to create the lasting inner contentment that the mind is looking for. This is just to serve the purpose of protecting the feet. Or if you hang up one of these signs on your refrigerator in your car, just know that it's it's impermanent. Or like example, a couple of months ago, we were invited to a really, really nice place to start holding our meditation classes here in Chiang Mai. It's a really old teak house, kind of the old northern style house. And this business owner and owner of these this facility invited our group to come there and start meditating regularly and one of the things i said when the group came in and fell in love with the place and the owner was really pleased that we were choosing to come there i said uh, hey everyone just remember this isn't permanent that this isn't something that we're going to have permanently because the place is just absolutely beautiful it's just aesthetically so beautiful and uh people were kind of like, huh, huh? Oh, oh yeah, that's right, that's right. So if you can kind of think right up front when you buy a new car, when you have a new relationship, when you move to a new house, when you get a new job, when you get new clothes, get a new computer, any of these things that come into your life, if you can just root in the mind, this thing is impermanent, 
So therefore, I'm not interested in my mind holding on to it. You can kind of get ahead of the curve with a lot of this stuff because there's stuff in your life now that you're holding on to and you're attached to that if it broke or you lost it or it got stolen, your mind might experience some discontentedness. And when you find those things, you have to slowly train the mind to let those go. But as you're doing new things and you're going to make new relationships, you're going to need new shoes or new new clothes or a new car. Just always train the mind. This is impermanent. This isn't me acquiring something to create pleasant feelings in the mind. This is me just acquiring something because I just need it in my life and I need transportation or I need a new home or I need new clothes or I need a new computer. It's what I need, not what I want. So if you pursue your needs and just fulfill those rather than chasing after your wants, then the mind can actually be quite peaceful and quite content right now because all your needs are fulfilled. But as long as the mind wants something else, the grass is greener on the other side, then it's always going to be discontent with what it's got because it always wants something else. So not only do you need to remind yourself that, okay, this new thing is impermanent, but remind yourself that this new thing isn't going to create lasting inner contentment, that you need to accomplish that without any of this external stuff. And rather than pursue and obsess over our wants, just fulfill your needs and make sure that you have the things you need. And what you're going to find is fulfilling your needs is very liberating because to try to constantly fulfill your wants is very expensive, which means you have to work a whole lot to make money to fulfill all these wants. If you're always wanting the newest computer, the newest phone, the newest pair of shoes, things like this, it's very expensive to do that which means you have to keep working and working and working. And that's that burden that the mind carries, the craving, desire, attachment. Whereas if you just fulfill your needs, then you actually see that you can live on very small amount of money and just be very content and uh, pleased with that. And the mind can then be inwardly satisfied rather than constantly pursuing the objects of its affection. So generally, it seems like that the things we acquire can be very useful until we turn them into attachments, at least. Yes, and everything has the potential of becoming an attachment or a craving. So that's where that mindfulness is so important. The Buddha talks about mindfulness in lots of different ways and lots of different settings. He calls it um, in the seven factors of enlightenment. He calls it always being useful, practicing that awareness of mind. In other teachings, he talks about it as a single guard. We talk about guarding the six doorways of discontentedness, but he also calls mindfulness the single guard. So if there's anything that you're practicing in terms of purifying your mind, mindfulness is such a high priority because if you have awareness of mind and you can see your craving starting to arise, then you can do something about it. You can take action. But if you don't have mindfulness then you don't study or you're starting to judge people. Then when you see those things with mindfulness, those unwholesome qualities of mind, you can cut that off and let it go. But without mindfulness, you wouldn't be able to accomplish any of that. And that's one of the reasons why breathing mindfulness meditation is such a high priority in the Buddhist path to enlightenment because without mindfulness, you wouldn't be able to accomplish any of the other goals on the path to enlightenment. And that elimination of craving, desire, attachment in breathing mindfulness meditation is such a high priority. So that's why everyone should be practicing that two or three times a day as part of your life practice. And that's where you're really getting the mind uh, tuned into the present moment and residing in the middle because you're having this building of awareness of mind and you're having this easier and easier ability to cut things off and let them go. And with these two things, the mind can really make some progress along with all the other steps on the Eightfold Path. And I suppose that's why it's so important that we not feel guilty when we catch ourselves feeling judgmental or feeling craving because that is simply our mindfulness acting on that rather than suppressing it and allowing ourselves to feel guilt, essentially. 
You got it, James. Uh, you know, sometimes when you learn these teachings and you see what should be and what you would like to be and wow, this enlightenment sounds so wonderful, you uh, can feel guilty when you're observing like, whoa, I'm not practicing these teachings the way the Buddha taught. Well, you're only six months into it or you're only 10 months into it, right? Or you're only a year into it. So if you have that awareness of mind, you're like, oh, I'm not practicing the five factors of well-spoken speech. That's why that person got angry. Okay, let me fix that because that's impermanent. Me not practicing the five factors of well-spoken speech, that's impermanent. I can fix that. And then when you work on it and work on it and work on it, and as you get it closer and closer, you've done all this work and developed all this ability to practice the five factors of well-spoken speech. That's why your mind will never go back and revert back to being unenlightened because once you do all this work to train the mind to so easily practice these teachings and you see it clean up all the relationships in your life and you see how your life is so smooth and so peaceful and so at ease, the mind's never going to be like, you know, I kind of liked it when I was angry and I had all that arrogance and all that ego and people were frustrated with me and yelling at me. I kind of liked all that stuff. Let me go back to that. The mind will never go back to that because it's seen the light, so to speak, right? It's, it's enlightened. It's seen the light. It's got too much wisdom to ever revert backwards to being unenlightened again. So that's why enlightenment, once you attain it, it's a permanent mental state that you will experience for the rest of this life. Well, thank you, David. That seems to be all that we have for today. Okay. So appreciate you guys joining for our meditation today. As you guys have questions, feel free to reach out in all the different ways that I always share with you guys. You can post on Facebook. You can ask a question in class. You can send a private message. You can schedule a personal guidance session with me. Remember that on this Sunday, we're going to be in chapter 24, which is the very last official chapter of the book, Developing a Life Practice, The Path That Leads to Enlightenment. This is where we're going to be talking about the misunderstandings that exist about Gautama Buddha's teachings today, because now that you've learned a fair amount of the Buddhist teachings, you're going to go into communities, you're going to be talking with other Buddhist practitioners who aren't necessarily practicing what you learn, because the words of the Buddha, you would think they would just be everywhere, right? Because those of us who grew up in a Christian uh, environment or that. even in a lot of the Buddhist temples they don't have these books so even ordained practitioners you would think that every ordained practitioner would have access to the words of the Buddha but that's not the way these teachings are in the world right now but that's what this community of people we're working to improve we're bringing the words of the Buddha into the mainstream so that more and more people can just download these teachings for free or get a book on Amazon and have the actual words of the Buddha with updated translations, with the reference and with explanations from a teacher. And that's part of our Pali Canon in English study group that we do on Sunday. So on, I'm sorry, on Saturday. On Sunday, we're going to be covering these misunderstandings so that as you're interacting in various communities that you understand that okay, yes, they're doing this ceremony. Yes, they're worshiping. Yes, they're praying to the Buddha. Some people are referring to the Buddha as a god, right? And when you see these things, having learned chapter 24 and attended our talk on Sunday, you'll understand a bit more why, and you'll understand why the Buddha didn't teach those things so that the path becomes more and more clear for you. So now that you've learned what the teachings are, now we can talk about some of the misunderstandings and make that path even more crisp exactly what is the path to enlightenment. And then next Wednesday, we'll be doing breathing mindfulness meditation together as we do as a class. On September 1st, we'll be restarting this program from the very beginning. And we're going to go through those series of classes like we did, where we focus on the eightfold path for three successive classes, really diving into it before we start chapter one in the book. And we're going to be doing the same thing with breathing mindfulness meditation, doing a four part class where we're diving into breathing mindfulness meditation and then a four part class diving into loving kindness meditation. But the way we're going to finish out this whole group learning program is we're going to focus on the five hindrances to enlightenment. These are the five things 
that are the most common things that stand in the way of somebody attaining enlightenment. So that's a good thing to kind of end the program on because now that you've learned all these teachings and you're progressing in your practice, you'd like to kind of know the five obstacles to look out for. And if those obstacles arise in your practice, then what I'm going to be doing is giving you the antidotes to those and how to fix them as well. So we're going to be talking about those towards the end of this month. So thank you all for joining. I will see you either this Saturday in the Polycanon English Study Group or Sunday or Wednesday in the group learning program. Have a lovely rest of your day. Sawadee again for watching. Enjoy your meditation. Look forward to seeing you online and answering any questions that you might have. Thank you so much.